links to your oh, work. Looks like, oh. looks like we're live. So welcome everyone. Um, I'm Ren. Oh, I'm Ren Honeyman here with Andrew Baskin from Lift Economy, and we're super excited to be joined by Oakland-based collective member of the Movement Generation Justice and Ecology Project, Desiree Fontenot. She's also a co-organizer of People of Color Sustainable Housing Network, Queer Eco Justice Project, along with a number of other local and national initiatives. Welcome, Desi. And uh, we're also joined by Lex Harlow, who's based in, uh, in New York City, uh, who until very recently served as membership engagement manager at the New Economy Coalition, and is now working with the Black Farmer Fund, along with the Central Brooklyn Food Co-op, Seed Saving, Building, and Farming in Puerto Rico. So welcome to Lex as well. Uh, so both Desiree and Lex actively have in the soil and movement organizing spaces. So hence, uh, the title of this session is Ecological Lessons for Movement Organizing. We were getting some seeds passed around earlier, so we know that this is real. <laughs> um, folks can trickle in as the, folk, as the conversation progresses, but we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, so really briefly, I'll go over housekeeping details. Again, some of you may know about um, Crowdcast and some of you may not. So really quickly on housekeeping, um, on the side where uh, Andrew just uh, posted is chat. So we'll have um, more conversational stuff. Um, chat, 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 says Andrew. Uh, and um, there's a little Q&A, um, ask a question box in the bottom sort of middle right of the screen. And that's where, where you can ask a more substantive question and it allows people to upvote and downvote the questions. Uh, and then we can also, you know, mark once we start answering that question in the recording, we can mark where it's answered. So then folks at, at the end can go back and see how that question was answered. Um, so again, you know, wanted to welcome you all. And one, one key part of this is we love to bring people up, uh, audience members up on screen. So if you're interested, um, you know, make a note in the chat at any point, we'll also sort of reach out to, to, the, to those of you in the chat or say it on the screen. Um, for folks who want to join us on screen, it's always fun to like see your face and to interact with the panel. Um, we want to keep this sort of this, like one-way conversation. We love it to be interactive. We're also live streaming to Facebook. So if you're on Facebook right now, you can come join us. Uh, the Crowdcast link should be in there. And the event is being recorded. You can watch it on um, Crowdcast later at any time or the Lift Economy channel on YouTube. So uh, again, thanks for joining me. Let me pass to Andrew uh, for framing of the session. Thanks, Ryan. So I'm gonna be as brief as I can, just to give a bit of cue up and framing to this conversation in case you're new to it. We've been doing this series, this is our sixth session. And um, just to give kind of a quick overview, how um, you know the Lyft Economy team, how we're holding this series. And uh, Kevin's in the background somewhere, you can't see him right now, but maybe later. Um, you know, we're not approaching this conversation as experts. Our, uh, our intention is to make this um, not actually about us, but to make it about all of us. And we want to be transparent and vulnerable that we're kind of still learning um, uh, just how to best to hold this space and facilitate emergence and um, grateful for um, kind of the patients, any, any patients that might be required with that emergent process and, uh, and support with caring, like, collective support with carrying this conversation to a place that really serves the the movement, the moment, the next economy movement, um, so on and so forth. So um, uh, yeah, so we're kind of just like playing this organizing convening role here and um, seeing like how can our, there's so many beautiful diverse parts of our next economy movement, which we're gonna get into in this, again, in this conversation, um, multiple levels, um, you know, the level of the economy, our community, local economy, enterprise, personally, emotionally. Um, and uh, yeah, we don't know how much work is sort of being done at the sort of quote unquote movement of movements level. And part of the goal of this series is to attempt to stitch together um, some of the like siloed movement conversations. And we especially wanna welcome folks who may feel like they're you know, quote unquote new um, or inexperienced in this idea of the next economy. 
Um, we're all at different stages in our journey. We wanna make sure everyone feels really welcome and included. So don't hesitate to ask questions or you know, um, post comments in the chat, et cetera. So just again, today, um, I'm so excited to be joined by two queer um, BIPOC organizers working at the intersection of ecology, economy, and holistic liberation for BIPOC communities um, and also everyone. Uh, Movement Generations, Desiree Fontenot and Lex Barlow. Um, and uh, we're, we'll be discussing some ecological lessons informed by queer BIPOC lived experiences that we can apply to um, even how we're thinking about this conversation, but um, our broadly next economy movement organizing. So, so excited to have both of you today and I wanna invite you to introduce yourself. So maybe uh, Desi, we'll start with you. Okay, cool. Hey everyone, um, good to be here. My name is Desi Fontenot, Desi or Desiree. I use she, her, or they, them pronouns. Can y'all hear me okay? Is that cool? Oh, okay. All right, cool. Um, yeah, so let's see. I Are we doing like what ecosystems I'm a part of? Where I would, that, that sort of thing? Okay, that's kind of the frame we went in with. So on a literal level, I live on Chichenyo Ohlone land um, in the Sausal Creek watershed in Oakland, California. Um, I've been here for about 10 years. I'm originally from Southwest Louisiana um, and grew up much on Tongva land in LA. Um, but since being here, some of the main uh, areas that I roll in are revolve in some form or way around um, collective determination and land justice um, with a lot of uh, queer and trans people of color and also um, black indigenous folks and networks more broadly. Um, I work at Movement Generation Justice and Ecology Project. Um, it's a collective member-based organization. There's 10 of us. Um, MG has been a political project for 13 years. I joined in 2018 because like a lot of people, I developed a huge crush on MG after going to some strategy retreats and earth skills programs. Um, and a lot of our work is uh, like movement pollination, similar to the the kind of core uh, vision of what this project is meant to be, like pollinating and connecting people across grassroots networks, campaigns and alliances um, through strategy and training work and also through cultural strategy work. So we also have produced some fun things like the North Pole web series and whatnot um, and work with folks here in the Bay, but also around the country, we have like, homies in the Gulf South and LA and Portland, um, Buffalo, New York, um, doing a lot of place-based work. Um, and then in this particular pandemic moment, we recently did a um, series called Course Correction, where we looked at the ecological context for pandemics, talked about just transition principles, decolonizing the future and a bunch of other fun things. I'll post a, a link to that. But um, a lot of my work within that realm and, and in and out of MG is about supporting rematriation efforts here locally. So bringing um, black indigenous folks together, housing justice and food justice folks together in various ways. And, um, and then the other part of that, some of the circles I roll in is folks building new cooperative infrastructure. Um, so I used to work at Northern California Land Trust before uh, working here at MG through the People of Color Sustainable Housing Network. Um, I've helped incubate projects like East Bay Permit Real Estate Cooperative and helping like QD BIPOC folks buy their building like the 23rd Avenue project in East Oakland, some, some of those things. And then I guess the last uh, but definitely not least like circles I roll in are black and brown, um, queer and trans farmers, gardeners, ten land tenders, grassroots ecologists who are, um, you know, cultivating deep practice of regenerative ecological practices, cultural revitalization and healing and, you know, working on pushing ecological education, ritual, ceremony as ways to to move this work in a really central way. So I'll stop there. Those are some of the wheelhouses I spin in.
passing the mic to you. Eli. Sure. Um, so, hey, everybody. My name is Lex Barlow. She and her pronouns. Um, I am currently in uh, Lenape Hoking, New York City, on this land um, in Upper Manhattan, and. Um, this is also, yeah, this is the land that mostly has stewarded me for most of my life. Um, and I also uh, have the amazing, amazing blessing to be in relationship with Boriquen or, or Puerto Rico, um, as well, land of Taino people. And um, thank you, Desi, for actually remembering to ground us in our actual, in our non-human ecosystems before we talk about humans forever. Um, but actually no, cause we're going to talk about seeds like very quickly. Um, but yes, yeah, so, so also introducing myself to, to jump off of Desi, I'll actually share that, um, uh, movement generation has also been a home and support place for me as well. Um, and I guess we probably met for the first time through something MG related. Um, and yeah, I, I, I worked for Movement Generation when I lived in the, in the Bay a couple of years ago and actually was introduced to MG before that as a student organizer. Um, and so, yeah, that, that has been family for a while as well and, and very important teachers for me as I go into all these other different directions and homes and places. Um, and so, yeah, following that, most, most recently, as y'all had mentioned, I was working at New Economy Coalition, um, which is a network of um, 200 plus organizations that are all working in very, very different ways, but many very important ways towards building new and different and reclaiming ancient versions of economy for um, people, mostly in the United States, but obviously connected to a global solidarity economy movement. Um, and so, on that level, that was, yeah, also kind of my, my work with MG and before that was very rooted in climate justice. And um, it was the, it was actually uh, when I was becoming connected to MG, it was when I was kind of understanding the importance of economy and building economy within what we're talking about as climate justice work, right? Like, oh, this problem with this thing called climate change has everything to do with the economy. And then what can we build from there and what can we do? Um, and yeah, and so as y'all mentioned, um, those are kind of on the national level, on the state level, um, a facilitator with Black Farmer Fund, which is a an emerging kind of launching right now soon, um, charitable loan fund for Black farmers and for and by Black farmers and food business owners in the state of New York. Um, and the idea is that this will be a fund and a pool of money that will be determined and invested collectively and you know received as well by by black farmers and food business owners in the state of new york so we're getting together right now and starting to practice what it looks like to do collective decision making um, over money what it looks like for black farmers and and chefs and all of these people to to be like oh wait not only do we deserve to, and not only do we have the skills to, you know, make decisions over this money, but we, we get to invest in each other. We get to invest in ourselves. And we get to design a process that we would want to go through around what it looks like for our community to invest in us. Um, and so we're, we're practicing that. Um, it's, it's new and exciting, and it's a big experiment. So we're seeing how it goes. Um, and importantly, um, in the city, I'm a member of Central Brooklyn Food Co-op, which is a Black-led food um, cooperative grocery store, TB, 2B grocery store. Um, doesn't exist yet, but we definitely exist and have been organizing for a while. And I just want to mention that um, CBFC is a member of the National Black Food and Justice Alliance, which feels like an important partner to shout out that is doing a lot of work to bring together um, black farmers and, and you know, people who are, are working on food justice on all levels and all scales um, around uh, Black Land and Power, which, which uh, maybe you've heard about the uh, Reparations Summer Project and some of that work, and also Self-Determining Food Economies, which looks like a lot of different Black food cooperative projects that look like all kinds of ways. Um, and I just want to just wanna shout out as well that an important teacher for me um, an important um, group that has like been a foundation for a lot of that work that I've mentioned so far is the Federation of Southern Cooperatives. I just want to shout them out and encourage folks to learn from them if you haven't already. They um, have been around for 50 
three years, um, which is almost a miracle considering how much repression and racism and violence they have faced trying to build a network of mostly but not entirely black cooperative farms and other kinds of co-op projects across the South. And they are a powerhouse and just, yeah, I really wanna shout them out as well. Um, and then lastly say that, um, yeah, all of that connects as well to, to a beautiful network that I've been a part of, of different seed keepers and people who are working to um, not only, you know, preserve seeds and, and the histories and traditions and practices on land that go with certain seeds in different cultures, um, but also to be building, uh, you know, I, I say a lot of my work has to do with experiment experiments around governance and us practicing like how we're going to manage our resources together how we want to relate to each other how we want to um you know hold the things that we need and how we want to share them um and so we've been doing a lot of work both in puerto rico and new york city around seed libraries um which are um kind of straightforward it's a library but with seeds and um you you take seeds out and ideally grow them, and at the end of the at the end of your season, whenever that is, bring back seeds so that there's this constantly living, constantly alive collective resource of seeds in the community, and also trying to build up um, community controlled seed supplies that are not about farmers having to buy seeds every year, and not about like corporations continuing to privatize and be in control of seeds, but rather reclaiming and rededicating these resources for us to share. Um, with each other, which is how seeds were always stewarded, you know, traditionally as well. So that's a whole bunch of stuff um, that I feel just really blessed to be learning from all these different amazing folks. Um, and yeah, all of our different webs that, that connect, I think for me and does mainly through MG, but also in, in many other ways as well. Thanks so much, Lex. Yeah, and hopefully, listeners, I want to remind folks, please, um, you know, engage with us in the chat, ask questions. We want to make this participatory and dynamic as much as possible. Um, but yeah, I, you can already just get a sense of the richness that Desi and Lex both bring across all of the circles that they participate in and with their unique identities. I'm personally really grateful to be in relationship and to have you on this call right now as like, a person that's focused on really similar things. There's a lot of overlap. So, and we're gonna get into this. We kind of just touched on that ecological layer there. And um, it's a great segue into kind of bringing forward. Um, I think I think what's a, one thing that's important to that are the layers of perspective that both like with the unique identities that um, particularly the three of us um, that are on screen right now, uh, Desi, Lex and myself hold as like BIPOC um, queer folks focus on the intersection of the, um, and if that doesn't uh, fit, please correct me, um, but at, at the intersection of regenerative agriculture and regenerative economy, um, you know, trying to lift as we climb. And uh, there's, there's many different perspectives that are integrated into that, that are on the ecological level, the economic level that are about being in relationship with folks on the ground and community. So I wanna maybe just open up the floor to um, both of you, Lex and Desi, um, to talk a little bit about uh, how stewarding and being with the land informs movement organizing work. And whoever feels inspired to jump in can take a lead in on that. I can, I can start when we're like giving each other a little talk break. Does, does that work for you, Lex? Okay, cool. Um, okay, so I was uh, marinating on this question because we, you know, had some, some prep on thinking about how to frame this because there's so much to say. Um, but I think what it comes down to for me is being in connection to land and place, um, both somatically and in how we think and understand what we're doing, what's the, the shared vision we're building together, I feel like it helps us really ground in what's the bigger story here. Because um, to me, it's it, that bigger story is an ecological one in our, our movement organizing. Um, one of the first concepts that we dive into with folks at MG is uh, coming to a shared understanding of what we mean by economy, right? And I think like you were reflecting, Lex, MG kind of like 
blew my mind and many others of like, oh, this is this demystifying of economy's relationship to ecology is kind of central to how we're we're thinking about what we're we're building together when we talk about the next economy. Um, and you know, like many things, we're trying to not talk about these things in such siloed ways. So we usually start by sharing that the root of the word uh, economy and ecology, eco, means home from the Greek word oikos. And, you know, e economy, eco plus nomi simply means the management of home. It's how we organize ourselves in a place, right? Ideally to take care of that place and each other, it's not inherently financial markets, currency, GDP, trade, all of that that's kind of been drilled into us is like, this is the economy, right? It looks different across different times at different scales. And I think for me getting it that like all economies are nested in these larger ecosystems. And if we're thinking about how are we gonna organize ourselves in relationship to place differently, we have to start by understanding um, our relationship to those ecosystems, to under, understanding that what we're trying to change, the, the systems of governance we're trying to shift are um, towards a, a different vision that's more bioregional, that's more based on the watersheds and food sheds and climate systems and cycles that we're a part of and grounded in, because all of our relationships to our ecosystems have been has been mediated through our economy, right? Just like our relationships are being mediated through the screen here and we're like, who's on the other side of this, but like, at the, <laughs> you know, I just want to like give that, give that out on my system, but that I think um, in understanding those relationships that um, economy is the management of home and we're trying to shift um, our social movement's bigger story is to shift the ways in which we manage home together is really important. Um, and I think one, just to get into a little story, like as an example of what that, looks like. So there's this amazing organizer with Gulf South Rising, Colette Pichon Batal, who's uh, from New Orleans, is a Black Bayou lawyer. She's actually the lawyer for the United Homa Nation, which is an unrecognized tribe that's, their their traditional lands are the on the wetlands of Louisiana. And um, they're definitely like intentionally unrecognized because if they had sovereignty over those wetlands, we couldn't have the oil industry in Louisiana that we do, right? But something that um, Colette has shared in different spaces and with MG after the Deep Horizon uh, spill um, in 2010, the Gulf South Rising folks came together and their primary demand became, we want our wetlands back. Their, you know, the demand could have just been, we want the spill cleaned up, we want, um, compensation for that but the demand was we want our wetlands back and just the like amazingness of what that does for how we bring folks together is really powerful because wetland getting our wetlands back means um, res restoration of indigenous sovereignty it means ending oil drilling it means bioremediation it means reparations like it means all of these different things that we're moving at once but it's a way of getting at that bigger story that what we're what we're moving towards um is is a, is a new ecological vision and it's complete economic transformation so that's it that's just like the like iceberg thing for me but i think that if we're not grounded in in uh ecology like it's hard for us to be connected to that bigger picture as we're building these new structures and cooperative systems and whatnot yeah that's i appreciate that story a lot just just showing like when we focus on repairing the relationship between humans on the land everything else transforms right everything mm -hmm. else has to transform it's not even a choice um and yeah, I think that's that's one of the things that I think about as well, like definitely coming closer to the land, reconnecting more and more, which, you know, there's also a lot to say about uh, there's reparations, money reparations, there's, re you know, repairing our, our relationships with each other and with the land. And I think when I think about what we're trying to build and what people, you know, what, what is it that we actually want to be different? in the world, it's all of our relationships, right? It's the way that the relationship between the state and people, the relationship between humans and border, the relationship, like all of these things. And 
actually one of those most important things that is at the at the foundation of all the other broken relationships is a broken relationship with the land. And so mm-hmm. I think that when we return to that as well, it's like, oh yeah, you when you when you actually start there, um, then everything else kind of follows. And yeah, one of the lessons, one of the stories that I want to share um, is um, inspired by these seeds. So I told Desi has some seeds too. Maybe they'll they'll come. They'll be, make an appearance. There they are. <laughs> that I wanted to share because so these are black eyed. They're pink eyed peas, which is a you know relative of the black eyed pea. Um, and uh, these seeds were actually given to me by a farmer in North Carolina. Um, and I, the reason that I want to bring up the black eyed pea just as a story has a lot in it because so, you know, most people maybe, maybe know that it's black eyed peas, like black people eat black eyed peas, they eat them on New Year's day, whatever. It's like a tradition. Um, I certainly grew up eating black eyed peas in my family, never fresh, like never just grown. Um, and so now growing black eyed peas is a whole other beautiful experience, but, um, I bring that up to to bring up George Washington Carver for a second because George Washington Carver, best known for you know being a peanut magician, but was also just a plant magician in general um, and a really important teacher, um, particularly for a lot of families who had who were on the land just after you know being emancipated, um, trying to figure out how to actually grow food for their families, not just like this one monocrop that they had been you know forced to to grow um, in enslavement. And George Washington Carver um, often brought black eyed peas to people and told them to plant them um, for the sake of the soil. And, you know, he's, because one of the things about black eyed peas is that they bring a lot of nitrogen to the soil and they're really good for healing and bringing back nutrients. And so much of the soil in the South um, after 1865 was in terrible condition because it had just been grown over and over and over again with, you know, one, two, three crops. And so he was like, yo, you actually need to plant these black eyed peas, but you can't eat them. You have to leave them in the soil um, so that the soil can become better so that what you can you can grow more and better later. Right? And this was actually really hard because these are people who straight up just came out of being enslaved and were like, what do you mean we're going to plant something and not eat it? Like, how is that, you know, even possible? And I think it's interesting also because black eyed peas in, in culture, for me, like had learned them as something that, sell, that symbolizes richness and prosperity. Um, and in that very way, right, George Washington Carver was also trying to bring this to people as like, let this be something that can enrich your soil. Um, and so this, for me, like this question has really guided me a lot. And it's something that I've been bringing to a lot of spaces, which is yes, one, we should just, you know, be working on the soil in general and soil health is really important. That's another thing that you learn more and more, um, the more that you work the land, but also, you know, taking that question of like, what are we planting now in our soil for our future harvest, um, down the road? What are the things that we're actually not planting so that we can get them in like six months, but we're planting so that our harvest like five seasons from now is, um, you know, so much stronger. And what, what are we planting to give life? And I think about that on the movement level as well, especially right now when it feels so wild to not be just doing the most immediate thing because all of the most immediate things, there's crises everywhere. Um, And it's, and this is the other thing about George Washington Carver doing that, which is amazing. Like, how radical to believe in having a future, how radical to believe that you might still be on that soil five years from now growing based off of this. And, you know, I think that's also really important for us um, now is like, we have to continue to believe in a future. Um, And so what are we planting now for that, um, for the things and the harvest that we're gonna get later on is a big lesson that I've learned and I'm just like trying to carry with me a lot. 100% 100% Lex I love that and um, yeah I, I think it's kind of like you're already kind of diving into this but just like thinking about I'd love to go into kind of linking what both of you just shared in how working with the land helps um, kind of understand how to work with people and movements and I feel like you just touched on that just to I, I want to pass it over to Desi but I want to maybe just share a quick thought of what came up for me as you were saying that is like, 
I was just thinking, as you're saying, George Washington Carver's having, you know, folks who are formerly enslaved, uh, you know, not get a return on that investment in the land. Like that, I think this thought maybe touches on this question that I'm asking, but like, it really has a lot to do with being in extractive versus like, uh, a reciprocal and a relationship that has reciprocity both with the land right it's like depleting and then that that applies both with people as well right like there's some people that we extract and extract from and what does like creating that the you know like in communities fertile ground to like invest in and maybe not expect a return that you might anyway that's just like i just wanted to name that but i want to hand it over to desi what's that's coming up for you around this. Yeah, um, always so many things, but I feel you just like what you're saying, Andrew and, and Lex, is like what you do to the land, you do to the people is one of those phrases that come up to mind, what you do to the people, you do to the land. Like we have to like keep coming back to like social inequity is also a form of ecological erosion. Like we can't have, um, an environmental movement with that that doesn't include social equity because the way our labor is extracted, it's usually used towards um, exploiting uh, the land in one form or another, right? And I love the example you shared, Lex. And like, it's not only the the work, but like just the way we even learn, yeah, learn about him. Like he coined the the term regenerative farming. I'm like, come on now, like what is we're, we're just missing so many things about like our uh, ancestors' ecological expertise. Um, and yeah, just, yeah, lots of, lots of, lots of things. Yeah, that, I appreciate that also because that's one of the, one of the other things that I've definitely learned from working with seeds is like, especially when you're trying to do it in a way that is not rely on you buying from a company. Um, you have to share knowledge with each other. There's no way, there's no other way to do it. Like you can't just give someone a seed and not tell them anything about it, how you harvest it, where it came from, whatever, like in order to build these community resources, there has to be also this, this building in of, of, community knowledge and as well the ancestral knowledge which is a part of our community knowledge that you know that you're speaking about and so I think yeah learning that that's very humbling and and I I, I was actually reflecting on this with the team at New Economy Coalition like before you know before I transitioned out which is one of one of the things that I've learned is like there's actually no way to build these things without without learning from all of the different wisdom of, of our ancestors. And I think that's another thing in, in um, particularly the solidarity economy, new economy movement that I've, that I've seen is like this, this idea that it is new, this idea that it is something that hasn't existed before when really all we're doing is repurposing, you know, and, and reclaiming and reconnecting with, with older things um, mm -hmm. that, and ways that our peoples have been for a really long time. Um, so I feel that as well, which is like, why would we think that we could build this without listening and without asking these questions um, and without, yeah, trying to uncover all of those different wisdoms that already exist for us? Um, mm -hmm. One of the things that I've definitely learned as well. And I feel like, Desi, I mean, you uh, uh, had this um, queer eco justice project and just kind of curious like bringing that lens into this too in relationship to like this conversation with the seeds and the you know movement organizing yeah. i feel like you have a lot to offer on that yeah so i guess like diversity 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 is sort of the like mm -hmm. the thing that comes to mind i think we spent a lot of time at mg like trying to take terms like diversity that have just been like co-opted and and used to like minimize our our the complexities of our identities of our ancestries of our geographies and actually reclaim that as like no diversity is actually our best defense in all of this um and i think being with the land really helps me and and uh ecosystems thinking in general helps our movements embrace more complexity right um 
me think, with the Queer Equal Justice Project. So one of my favorite quotes, I, I do this like queer ecology quiz where I personify a different being and uh, people guess like who I am. So like for one is like, I have 36,000 different uh, genders, different ways of um, expressing my sexual and asexual physiology. Who am I? And folks are like, what, 36,000? And it's, it's mushrooms. But um, one of my favorite quotes that I say after doing that quiz is, um, in biology, nature abhors a category. Um, and it's a, from a transgender ecologist named Joan Roughgarden. Um, but for me, it just like, in, the more and more that I work with plants um, and learn about different ways of embodiment, different forms of kinships and care systems and interactions that happen in nature, the more like lessons um, I uncover about adapting and surviving and cooperation. And um, I think our movements really need that to, to think about what, um, like what resilience looks like for us. Um, and like, I think one, um, one example we talk about a lot is that we have uh, a tendency to think about like redundancy as like duplication in our movements. Like I think one big frustration a lot of folks working in movement circles feel when we're like asking for funding, we're all like um, explaining how we're the only ones who do what we do and like you should be really excited about that, but like that should actually really worry you. Like, if if we if what we do is so important, um, we sh there should be a lot of us doing it and a lot of different scales. And I think fighting against the impetus that we you know inherited from like nonprofit industrial complex and other ways in which we we try to move through the current economy is to not like okay then if you're great we're just gonna make you bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and it's like no actually we don't we don't need that like we actually need. Um, diversity and redundancy at, at a scale that um, that makes sense for our our movements to function and to spread and to to do all these things. So I just think like there's yeah there's just a ton of lessons in ecological diversity um, that we we could take in in a, in a much different way. Thanks for the fire science. It's yeah, so, I know I have people texting me. I'm like I know there's other people out there. So get up in that yeah. chat. <laughs> yeah and like you, Cosmos, our, for the fire signs <laughs> yeah and like i remember lex and our kind of conversations offline around this um we were chatting about kind of like i know that the three of us there's like we know some of what we're talking about here through experience but it might be helpful to share um some of like the stories of witnessing just like personal transformation that result from even act like ac accessing an experience of being in relationship um, with like ecology um, and that intersection between ecology and economics. I'm not sure if that question made sense, but. Say more. Yeah, yeah. So I think I, I was just recalling, um, yeah, just like stories of sort of personal transformation around, um, um, engaging with like I think I mean I think like Desi was just kind of describing it a moment ago it's like that I'm trying to figure out how to translate this here um I can share my own personal experience with it um but yeah there's just something that's like so um, grounding, I don't know what to say, but like grounding in, in being in relationship with growing, um, growing something from seed and eating it and feeling like that full cycle. And I, I guess I'm just like partly pulling out of a hat, this out of a hat. So we don't need to go in this direction. Um, and if there is something that's there for you, we can go into that. But maybe another interesting direction to go might be um, another thing that I think we had talked about is like, again, learning from C, I, like, I think part of what we're holding with this conversation is like how, 
how can we both see some of you know these lessons from that we get from ecology from being in relationship with it directly um, and how we can take some of those lessons and apply them in our work um, particularly in like a movement building space but broadly and so part of that is like seeds are not an overnight thing you know there's like building lasting relationships stewardship and learning from wisdom passed down from ancestors and i feel like all of that applies so, i was a little spaghetti still but i'm just gonna st step back <laughs> um i mean i d i will share definitely i think one thing that's really important you know for this directly and and i would love to you know hear your experience with it as well desi because i don't think we've spoken about it directly it's just actually being being a, a black person being a person who's descendant of people who were enslaved in this land um the work to reconnect with land and growing things on land is a very um heavy journey and I feel like I am carrying a lot of other people with me in it. Um, there's, you know, I think about like my family migrating to New York City from the South and that moment of, uh, that moment of what happened there with the like breaking of the relationship with the land. Um, and yeah, I'm, there, there is something that I've heard other young Black folks say as a returning generation of farmers, right? And I don't, I don't consider myself a farmer, but that's a longer story. I just don't think I'm official enough for that. But um, I, I do think, you know, somebody who is who also considers to be in that returning generation to the land, and there's so many of us, and I will say most of us are queer, and we can talk about why that is later too. But um, I think I think there there's something really important as well that. Um, yeah, there's there's a power. Um, I was actually on a on a different webinar um, the other day, uh, I think organized by Why Hunger, and it was about state violence in the food system. And there were a lot of really dope people on there. And there was somebody on there from the Indian Collective, um, NDN, and they, you know, the, and basically at the end of the call, she was like, "Yo, we're gonna get our land back." And part of the reason we're gonna get our land back is because of the uprising of Black people in this country, and because of Black people reconnecting with the land, and like understanding the like i just thought that i thought that was beautiful and i and i also think the understanding the 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 radical potential that's created when black people are reconnecting with the land after the land being this site of violence and after so much displacement and black people fleeing the south and fleeing the land and all of this stuff and people in my family you know who who still consider kind of like aren't, haven't, aren't we trying to move away from that shit aren't we trying to like you know that was then this is now um, and that's not in any way to look down on any of those folks because it's all journeys and it's all trauma and we're just carrying all of it. Um, but I do, I do think that, yeah, I, I would love for as well, the solidarity economy movement and just all these spaces to be able to honor the power that is in black folks reconnecting with the land and just support that by any means necessary, like by any means necessary. It is just, um, so many beautiful futures are, are are becoming possible that we never even imagined because this is happening right now. And yeah, it's it's a beautiful thing and it's also a heavy journey and it's just all of those things at once. You're on mute, Andrew. <laughs> my bad, my bad, thanks. Thanks, Desi. I appreciate that. Yeah, I was just saying I have to build on what you just shared with that because and also what you said around being a farmer. And if this doesn't land for you, that that's fine. But I was just thinking about this in relation to myself recently, and I want to share it with you. All, um, is like speaking of seed, we're talking about seeds, right? And so there's this idea in ecology of success of ecological succession, right? And if like soil is super compacted or otherwise the conditions are not conducive for that seed to grow, they won't grow. And and but it is conducive for other types of things that which we typically call weeds um, that help to to protect and restore that space um, and maybe like keep humans away uh, or try. But I like as I'm thinking about myself, I don't have access to land right now. Right. Um, but I do 
even though I'm not actively farming, I mean, I, I garden in my backyard, but I'm not actively farming. I feel like I'm one of those seeds that's like waiting in the soil for mm -hmm. those conditions to be healthy again, because I don't want to put myself in an exploitive situation, right? Where I'm like on someone else's land, I'm in investing all my life energy in this. And then it's something that can just get yanked from underneath me. Right. So it's like, I'm tr I think we're trying to like cultivate those conditions through our work, like economically, socially to be able to do that. So I just wanted to offer that up. Yeah. Can I just quickly, before you jump in, does he name one other thing that feels really important? Um, the 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 question of land right you're saying like you know you don't have land right now this is like there's so many um incredible people that i'm just literally thinking of in my head right now who are black people who are returned to land who do not own any land and do not have access to owning land right now and we can get into and i'm sure desi you can also speak more about like okay is it even land ownership that we're looking for right like what is the relationship with the land that we want to have but in the situation that we're in where black farmers and people on land have been pushed off of millions and millions of acres of land that used to be under black ownership. Um, that question also feels inescapable too. Um, and I think in also envisioning anything that is about what's coming next for our economies, it's gonna be on the land. We have to return to the land whether we like it or not. And also, um, yeah, how are we, you know, continuing to think about like how shit can be as equitable as possible in that process and how reparations can be happening at every step of the way. Mm -hmm. Can I, can I ask, oh, sorry, Jesse, you, you were gonna follow up. Yeah, I just, um, yeah, I, I resonate with many of the threads y'all are, are, are speaking on. Um, I think, just in terms of of land, like just looking at, you know, we're we're based in U.S. social movements here, but like there's so many examples in the global South of folks taking land through through custom, through um, a model of organizing of like we're here, these are the resources we need, we're governing them, and we're contesting for the power to be here um, that we can learn from um, in a lot of ways and as we're in this you know global economy context where we're trying to unlock the door of so much enclosed wealth which is enclosed land and enclosed stolen labor right um there's you know kind of back to the the diversity of of, of tactics there but we can we can go on and on and about that um but yeah i also wanted to just plus one on um, journeying back to land as a, a young black person um, and the layers of, of um, healing like land-based trauma in that. Um, I come from three generations of Louisiana sharecroppers. My mom uh, was the first person to move. Like my family didn't move during the great migration and um, you know, her relationship to land, like she tells me stories of picking potatoes instead of going to school. And, and um, it's taken uh, just like a different different layer of engagement of like what the work that I do um, as a gardener. I haven't been a full-time farmer in a while. And similarly, like I tried not to call myself a farmer unless I'm like all in. <laughs> but yeah, I guess it's like, just claim it. You do some things uh, and you know how to do them. But um, yeah, I just wanted to, to second that, that like, not underestimating the power of healing our connection to land um, as, a, as a catalyst for deeper politicization and how we think about um, the work that we're doing in, in all kinds of, of sectors and walks of life, so. Yeah. Ryan, you, I think you had a question you wanna? Yeah. Well, I just wanted to appreciate both you, like, and Desi around just like, Whenever you speak about land, it just feels so grounding and like comforting. Or just like there's a there's a, like it, it just shifts the mood when we're talking about like the generation of land and like grounding in. Like it's just it's so much a different conversation than like how do we like fix the economy? like conversation. So I just want to appreciate both of you um, for that. Um, and like I guess my question is like a, a little bit of the larger movement piece. Um, you know. There's not as many folks in the streets as there were, say, in June, you know, and like here we are now. And I'm just sort of, sort of like, 
how do you see, are you optimistic or pessimistic about both like what has happened since, um, you know, since May with uh, Breonna Taylor and George Floyd? And then also like what is, um, you know, like, are you optimistic or pessimistic about that? Like the, our, our society's ability to like continue this sort of progress. And I think it, this relates to land piece you're talking about, but I also just wanted to bring in like, and Desi, you maybe like, since you're a part of movement generation, maybe you've seen like this, like this is how movements work, et cetera. So I wonder if you could bring that lens in too. Um, so that's my question. <laughs> Well, do you want to start on that, Lex? Or... Well, no, but the, the I mean, the first thing that comes to my head is the MGism transition is inevitable, justice is not. Like, I think that's the first thing that actually I thought of in response to that question, but I'm gonna let you expand on it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, just a little, I mean, I think personally, I feel, um, I think like everyone in this time of like uncertainties and like really interesting um, shocks happening like every few months in in the political climate, I oscillate, you know, like it's been a weird pandemic. Um, but I think overall just kind of witnessing movement cycles, um, I feel very optimistic. Like I think after, um, like organizing in 2014 and 2015 with uh, Black queer formations here in Oakland, uh, kind of seeing like the movement lessons from then, like showing up now in in a in a way has been very interesting to me. And um, I'm, you know, obviously there's caution in like you know what are the the interventions that will actually lead to systemic change and what are some of the the mainstream co-optations of those those intentions you know like corporations doing their little we love everyone thing versus like um minneapolis defunding a police department like just straight up you know i think that we could hone in on um the the interventions that are are getting us get actually creating new conditions in this moment and then we're going to keep building from there um i think that for a lot of folks um when the moment i'm gonna use the term not that's not actually for movement generation but the folks at momentum who do a lot of like strategy training they call like uh moment of the whirlwind is like the risk the framing for like when there's large mass movement protests and all that and i think people could get a little sad when the the height of that uprising is starting to go down but there's so much happening like through layers of relationships and networks and resource distribution like there's some very exciting um ask around and 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 just kind of new initiatives around moving money in a big way and maybe Lex you could talk about reparation summer um that come out of these like big cultural narrative shifting um moments and yeah and it's also a lot it's like a lot for all of this to be like uh catalyzed from like the re-traumatization of um black bodies and black communities like I had um on a personal note like a cousin of mine was killed by police in 2017 and every time this happens there's just new things to process and it's like yeah so I'm always like juggling out of like ah, does this always have to you know can this much movement energy happen or be motivated not from you know the in incredible public brutality but but like through black joy like can people see us farming reconnecting with the land and be like i just is inspired <laughs> to like be in solidarity you know what i mean so that's some of the maybe just to connect it back to this conversation like i want to know how we could have moments of the whirlwind that are motivated by us us seeing the irresistibility of the world we're trying to build. And I, and I think I always come back to that in the like, kind of we're stopping the bad and building the new and we're doing that dance all the time. Um, yeah. yeah. 
Nice. Ryan, I know you had have to head out to grab gra grab the kids. So um want to just acknowledge that. I'll see you soon. And uh <clears throat> thanks for sharing that, Desi. And I can I add something real yeah, quick? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please, 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 please. No. Um, yeah, that just makes me think about um that just makes me think about as well, right? Like this thing that's happening where actually a lot of black projects are getting flushed with money um, in this moment. And obviously, you know, it's it's nowhere near the reparations that are actually deserved. But um, some some there are definitely some black organizations that like all of a sudden found themselves with way more money than they even knew what to do with. And I think that's another reason. Um, you know, that us practicing these kinds of things is so important. Like I think with, with the Black Farmer Fund, the idea is like, okay, yes, we're still trying to figure out right now where all of this money can come from, but actually a, a big moment, like bringing in a whole bunch of money, we're gonna be ready for it because then we already have a process and we already have learned lessons about how we wanna redistribute and invest money in our community when things like that happen. Um, that feel like those types of things where it's like what we're actually what we're actually looking for is yeah a world where we're not fighting things but black farmers are just on land living their lives sharing food with each other sharing resources with each other and when there's money we figure out how to share it so that we all benefit and we so that we all you know and just doing our thing and democracy like a practice of democracy being a part of what it means to do our thing. Um, and not always something that has to, you know, um, be contesting or like begging or like whatever. I'm trying to suck things out of this, out of this system. So that that was just something, you know. I think the governance piece, and I think the, yeah, that feels even more important in moments when it's like, okay, here's the uprising. There's always there's a next part to the uprising, right? There's always something that happens next. And, and what we need to happen next is for communities to be ready to absorb all of that energy and be using to do the things that we need to do for each other. Which I feel like kind of aligns with cycles of farming. I'm just saying as an aside, but <laughs> like putting in the work, planting the seeds, harvesting, doing it. Um, but yeah, we only have a couple minutes left. So I just want to, yeah, give you both the floor to share um, any closing thoughts. And I, I can't ask a question if that, feel, if that feels generative, but um, just want to hold space for you to chime in with kind of any remaining or closing thoughts. Or, I was going to say, if anyone watching wants to ask a question, that would be great, too. Just want to know, like, who's out there? Yeah. What you, what's on your mind? Even if you just want to type it in the chat. Yeah. Um, if nobody has a question, Desi, I would also love to hear what you think of the question I asked earlier around the last piece, which is the, like, what do you want or need us to be planting now? for our like leader harvest. Can you understand? Mm -hmm. there, I'm getting a little bit of feedback. Is that just me? Andrew, can you mute real quick? Okay. Yeah, it, the question that I was asking around the Black Eyed Peas, which is the, like, what are we planting now um, to enrich our soil um, mm -hmm. for longer? Oh, someone, oh, I'm interested to hear your take on why so many returning farmers are also queer. Um, okay, let's answer that one. Um, <laughs> because I want to hear what you think too. Um, I think that it is because, um, I think that it's because basically all the things we've been talking about is like all the shit that we're talking about, you know, restoring relationships and imagining new ways of being and all of this stuff is basically what queer people have to do um, in their lives. I think that I have learned so much about, um, yeah, imagining different types of relationships, imagining relationships that don't, I don't see in front of me, imagining relationships that don't um, necessarily exist in my reality that, but you feel and you feel that you need um, and you feel that you want. And so I think that it's queer people have always been at the forefront of everything that has to do with that. Um, and so it's no surprise to me at all that queer people are at the forefront, forefront of bringing black folks back to the land um, that queer Black people are are the ones doing that because there is already 
this experience with having to like rebuild and and reimagine relationships in different ways and also just like a vision and a and a way of doing it that yeah you can only get from the experience of having had to that feels important cool i love that um uh hi julia julia is my partner hi julia <laughs> um i uh let's see well i think to answer your question and maybe julia's question together i think planting seeds of um just more cutie bipoc led projects whether it's land projects or cultural strategy projects and bringing that bringing the like connections that have always been there just to the forefront more like the queer eco justice project has been about that of just like how have we always been in this in this uh sort of intertwined set of questions around um what does it mean to uh like to to like bring together like um bodies and lands like i feel like that that helps me think about like queerness and relationship to land because it's like there's so much diversity and difference you encounter in the natural world and we're used to being told that like you're a crime against nature but like when you get into nature and the immense like vastness of what this this planet and this universe is is like oh no nature is the queerest thing in the world so <laughs> i think that's like also a reason why a lot of queer folks um are in in this returning generation um yeah, and I just want to plant more seeds for for folks to to have long term sustainable relationships with place, because um, like they say, all revolutions based on land, so gotta be getting it. And I'll end on that. <laughs> plus one to that. Plus one to that. Yeah. Thank you both so much. Um, I can stay on for a few more minutes um, if if there's anything else that's coming up, but I also want to honor everyone's time. And yeah, this has been so much fun and, and such a pleasure. And I'm yeah, really, really grateful to you both for being on and sharing all of this great wisdom. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you, Desi. Um, more soon. Yeah, I look forward to more soon. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Everybody. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye.